I am a roboticist. How cool is that, right? <laughs> In many ways, this is a golden age for robotics. We have robotic cars driving in our streets, robotic prosthetics are enhancing human capabilities, and artificial intelligence is seeping into every part of our lives. Technology is so much a part of our lives today that my four-year-old daughter thinks it is totally normal for mom to show up in preschool class with robots when they're studying the letter R, because of course R is for robots, right? <laughs> but in this age of innovation, I think it is really important for us to stop and ask what percentage of the global population is truly benefiting from these innovations? And what happens to those who aren't fortunate enough to benefit? So fly with me now to Sri Lanka, where a little girl, the second of six children, is growing up in a single-income family. So as you can imagine, life is a little difficult sometimes, but she has food to eat, she has access to free education, and she has parents who love her and who support her dreams. So they encourage her despite many different difficult odds. And she escapes when she is older the raging civil war in Sri Lanka to come to the USA and ends up in Pittsburgh um, there where she learns about computers and becomes an innovator. That's a pretty cool story, right? Well, it's a good story, and it is a true story because it is my story. In many ways, it is amazing that I am standing here before you today. We all have heard that women and minorities are underrepresented in technology. Yet here I am, a brown woman, a mother, a roboticist, and an innovator. That's pretty cool. Thank you. <laughs> so perhaps then it is not a surprise that I chose to design my career in innovation to work with communities that are underserved by technology. These are communities <clears throat> that have very different needs and challenges compared to the mainstream, and they have um, individual purchasing powers that many people consider insignificant. So how does technology help them? Well, this is what I have been working on for over 15 years now, and it's taken me into many parts of the world. So what can I share with you? What are three lessons that perhaps I can share with you that I have learned? First, innovators should become respectful listeners. This is really important. So now remember how we went to Sri Lanka? We're gonna fly over to India next and go to a small school for blind children named Mathru, where we will meet one young student named Lalitha. Now Mathru is not a rich school financially, but they do pretty incredible work helping children who really don't have a different pathway to a fulfilling life. They teach them life skills and academics. But their methodology of uh, teaching involves students having to learn Braille when they're really young, right? <clears throat> they learn Braille, and then they listen to teachers teaching them. They take notes in Braille. They study from those notes, take exams, and then if they do well in those exams, they can progress academically. So you don't learn Braille, you're stuck. So what is Braille? It's basically a way of reading and writing uh, that's tactile, right? So you can read with your fingers. And in many languages, Braille involves a six-dot system where embossed dot patterns map to characters, symbols, or contractions. In the developing world, we use a slate and a stylus to write Braille. So you take this slate, you put a sheet of paper in, you take the stylus, and you press down in the dot patterns that you want to make. You take the sheet out, you flip it over, and you read. Sounds simple enough, right? But if I think about Braille and their learning method from the perspective of Lalitha, 
you'll realize that Lalita is blind. She doesn't really understand why she needs to learn Braille. She's struggling with fine motor skills and perhaps is not very um, strong because of malnutrition. Even though when, when my daughter learns one alphabet, Lalita has to learn three. She has to learn the letters of whatever alphabet, uh, whatever language she's learning, and then she has to learn the written and uh, writing versions of that alphabet in Braille, right? Now, it's even worse than that, because a lot of Lalita's teachers are blind. So the way they teach her is they say, write these sets of characters, then they go and they take the paper out, they read it, and they say, Lalita. The fourth character you wrote, the third dot is wrong. So with this delayed feedback, it is almost impossible for Lalita to learn Braille. This brings us to the second lesson. I believe that innovation should be a truly collaborative process. Now, when we first started working on this project, there were a lot of ideas thrown on the table by our innovators. They said things like, oh, we should just get Matri to change their way of teaching Braille, or better still, we should get rid of Braille altogether and just use audio, right? But in my line of work, you learn something really quickly. You learn that you really need to give the people who you are innovating for a voice in that process. You need to work closely with them so that they truly feel a joint ownership of your solutions. So instead of sitting in our lab and dreaming about what might be uh, or might not be useful to Lalita and Mathru, we actually worked very closely with Mathru. And together, we in invented an automated Braille writing tutor. This tutor basically speaks to Lalita as she learns to write Braille, okay? Now, this tutor is affordable, accessible, locally maintainable, and most importantly, it addresses Mathru's needs without forcing them to change anything that they didn't want to change. So in other words, we respected their vision for progress and together, we built something that addressed their needs. This brings me to the third ex um, lesson. Innovator experiences really influence inventions. Now, we did several iterations of the Braille Tutor, and when we went to Mathru to test it, the school told us that Lalita really doesn't understand the concept of Braille. When they gave her a, an exercise to do in writing Braille, she basically just embossed all six dots in one of the Braille cells and handed it back. But Lalita surprised everyone when she started working with the Braille writing tutor. She demonstrated that she understood writing Braille almost perfectly. So what changed? So you see, Lalita had understood everything about writing Braille except one key thing, that you have to write each character in a different cell. Now, her exercises were always write all of these characters, and her teacher was blind, so she couldn't see that Lalita wasn't moving from cell to cell. So the combination of these things labeled Lalita incorrectly. But the tutor started speaking as soon as Lalita was writing and the teacher could hear in real time what Lalita was doing. And this may, uh, allowed her to immediately diagnose the problem. We have many stories like this. This Braille tutor alone was translated to work with several different languages and taken to many countries around the world. Every innovator who worked on this project was changed by the experience and became better innovators because of it. And Mathru changed as well. When we started working with them, they knew very little about technology, and they were even afraid of it. But now they speak up. They know about technology. They are empowered innovators. They can tell people, this is what we want, and it doesn't matter what the rest of the world thinks. And now they are excited about technology. This makes me happy. But you see, you don't have to travel very far in order to get these experiences. So let's now fly all the way back to Pittsburgh and meet Ethel. She's a visually impaired adult 
who uses a white cane, a guide dog, and travels by bus. Through an outreach project, we were able to invite Ethel and some of her community to come and interact with one of our robots. And they were thrilled. This is not something we had anticipated. So we started talking with them about their lives and their challenges. And we learned it is very difficult for Ethel to navigate complex indoor spaces. So now we are working with her to figure out what kinds of robotic innovations can help her to navigate, say, an airport or a bus station. Is it helpful to hold on to a robotic finger and have it trace a path as it tells you the directions? Or is it better to hold a little robot in your palm as you walk around and it gives you little directions about which, uh, which way to go? Or better still, maybe you want to hold on to a real robot and have it guide you like a guide dog. These are very cool questions to ask. We also learned that it is incredibly dangerous and difficult for Ethel to cross traffic intersections. So we started asking, hmm, smart traffic lights. What can they do to help Ethel? So now we have smart traffic lights that talk to Ethel's smartphone, right? So the smartphone can tell the traffic light, hey, Ethel's here. She needs to cross to this specific street corner, and she can comfortably move around this speed. And then the traffic light can take this into account when it's scheduling and say, hey, smartphone, it's now safe for Ethel to cross and give her enough time so that she can cross safely. We're also looking at schedules and routes for the city buses so that we can tie that into the system and then Ethel and others don't have to stand out in the freezing cold for hours trying to get a bus to take them to their next destination. These stories are real. They are happening. And I think that these are some of the stories that make this a truly golden era for technology innovation. My wish for all of you is that more innovators will step out of their comfort zones, listen respectfully to different communities, and work together to make technology that truly benefits everyone. Thank you. <laughs>